Good material here. Uh, we're now open for questions. There we go. Um, wait, wait, wait. I have to pronounce it correctly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Sunshine Project. I noticed that the tracks were quite differently, different than, uh, than at the Uppsala <coughs> track. Yes, that's right, absolutely. Um, the, I mean, fundamentally, the, uh, the system is the same. We are running on um, steel track, we have steel guide rails, uh, we're using very similar propulsion technology, um, but the visual appearance of the track is quite different. We're dealing with very large spans between the uh, pillars uh, along the route, so we've got concrete beams, whereas originally we had what you might term it, it, more like a roller coaster track. I mean, it was effectively a steel tube with the guardrails fixed to it. So yeah, it does look different, but it's essentially the same. Hi, Anna Quarantumia from the Minister of Environment. I was wondering what is, uh, what's your um, politician saying in the UK about your experiences, for instance, in Heathrow, and uh, do they um, uh, promote this uh, within the European Union, for instance, within the, among their colleagues? Not at, not at the moment. Hopefully after next week they will. Um, it's been purposely below the radar for quite a while, just in terms of making sure everything's running uh, and, and proven properly. As you can understand, Heathrow has a history of uh, large projects not necessarily going well on launch, so they wanted to make sure that this one's right. So hopefully, once that's gone public, there'll be much more interest and they'll kind of push it a little bit further. Yes, I wonder about the future plans for the Heathrow system. How many stations are planned in the future and how long distance track about? At the moment, um, I know it's been thought about, there aren't any specific plans. There was originally, when we laid it out, there was kind of a, a, a grand plan to connect all the terminals. The, the north side of the runway into the central terminal area and we're talking about 400 vehicles but at this point it's just phase one um, and there is an end commitment to go to the next step. There's lots of interest and I know they're thinking about it. If I may say something, I've noticed that Norman Foster who helped develop the Mazda plans with some others have come forward with a plan for an ascent. They're, they're presenting it as a replacement <coughs> for Heathrow in the Thames Estuary, which isn't a completely new idea, uh, but it's being resurrected again. And I wonder, would that have any direct influence? Or, okay, what, 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 how would you speculate that will be accepted and how might it affect the future of Heathrow? Since, since you're no longer with me, yeah, I know, you can I, I, I know, I <laughs> I would be very surprised they built another airport in London. That's all I can say. I just It's been talked about a lot, but I'd be very surprised if another airport goes anywhere in London. No chance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But, so you consider that London, though? I mean, it's almost yeah, so yeah. far away that it's... No, it's, it's, it's we even consider Luton, London. Yeah. That's about 18 months yeah, away. we've already got <laughs> six airports yeah. in London, so the chance of getting another one is quite remote. I wonder how we will uh, prevent uh, vandalism or deal with that. Vandalism? In, in Heathrow? No, on the pods and so on. The passengers might um, do something or so. Yeah, no, and I, that was actually one of, in terms of the design processes, one of the issues we, we thought a lot about. Um, to get, probably the main kind of way we go about it is through CTTV. There are constantly 24 hours. Every time it's running, there's controllers watching. Um, to, and we have also some very strong security concerns. But in terms of the design of the interior, there was specifically, it's a, it's a molded plastic, so if you scratch it, it doesn't change color. It's anti-scratch material on the glass. And so there's things, the interior was designed specifically with vandalism in mind. Um, and there's also a maintenance program that monitors them, and if anything does happen, the intention is to pull it out, s sort it out before it goes back into, in, into service, so we don't leave vandal vandalized vehicles in service. 
up until now we haven't had any problems. Uh, my name is David Little. Um, question for Robert, similar to the question on Heathrow expansion, um, are there plans to add vehicles to the existing system or to, to extend or TBD? Uh, to be determined. <laughs> I, I mean, um, what they see with the undercroft and the costs that there are, I don't see them extending the undercroft to next phases. It is part of phase 1B. There is a station which is ready, so we could expand towards that area. But to be honest, it's also 100 meters to 150 meters walking distance from the station that's already there. So does it make sense to expand it for phase 1B? Uh, I, I doubt it. Uh, I, I guess the proof of expansion is in how well the system is utilized and carrying three times more passengers than is expected is at least a success for this phase. So uh, obviously I as a vendor would very much love Mastar to reconsider and look towards how you integra uh, integrate it without an uh, undercroft. I mean, in the end, that's their decision, and I'll try to influence it the best I can, but that's all I can do. Yeah. Uh, I forgot to say, my name is Arno from Oslo, and I would <coughs> like to ask another question uh, regarding the uh, Tantron project. <laughs> Uh, uh, the enlargement of the cabins. Um, uh, in my view, I think uh, Taxi 2000 had the best design and the best reason for making the design they had, have still. And that is one bench for three adults. And uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the door uh, they made, uh, you, you may enter standing. I mean, you don't have to hunch, go down. And uh, the reason for making only one bench was that you get people easily in and out because that's the that's the uh, bottleneck in in a PRT system, getting people in and out at the stations. Uh, but I have a my feeling is that uh, you made a different design because. You have a you use the PRT for this different purpose at St. John. Not sure whether you're asking me a question or you. Uh, I'm Did asking for a denial or a confirmation. Uh, <laughs> well, I can't comment on Taxi 2000 because I had no involvement in that whatsoever. Um, but what I can say is that the approach we've taken is very much. I mean, the issue of getting people on and off, boarding and alighting times on any public transit system is is critical. Obviously, there are other issues as well. But uh, we've got a, a 900 wide doorway which easily allows for eight people to get on and off the vehicle in a very short period of time. We have two bench seats, so I would imagine that's answering your question in terms of the, seat, the seating configuration. Um, we have a two meter headroom, so you can walk in standard, which does differ slightly from the current vehicles, which are slightly lower. So yeah, out of, I mean, that would distinguish our vehicle from others, that, you know, it is a, a walk-in vehicle. And there is consideration being given to be able to expand the vehicle to be slightly larger. And in that instance, you might even have standing passengers. So we, I mean, I'm gonna talk a bit more about this tomorrow, but the, the philosophy behind the design is that it should be modular and expandable so that we can develop or offer a range of vehicle sizes from a common inventory of parts from the same way of thinking. Um, but if you're around tomorrow, I might explain it a bit more. <laughs> uh, hi, Richard uh, Bingwitz. Just uh, a question about, I don't like going backwards on trains sitting in a uh, riding opposite direction. Well, in, um, in this matter, when you have several pods coming, is there a possibility that people will go in and just occupy one side and leave the other side empty? Is this a question you, for me? Uh, or generally? Uh, generally, yeah, generally. Uh, I think you'll find that um, 
I mean, I've worked on a lot of transport systems around the world, and if you go over to Australia, for example, they absolutely hate travelling in the direction, or against the direction of travel. And every time you design a train in Australia, you have to have a flip over seat. Uh, a bit like the old trams, we have a trip chain and you pull them and all the seats flip over. Um, I think we're a bit, I don't like to say, use the word educated, it sounds a bit patronising, but I, know, you know, I think we're a bit more flexible you know, in this part of the world, certainly. And I know in Korea they don't have an issue with it. Um, yeah, if there's uh, two people getting on a, on a vehicle, they may well prefer to sit on the seats facing forward. That's their choice. But, um, I mean, I've travelled on the Heathrow pod, for example, and I've seen no evidence that uh, anybody's got a problem with facing the wrong way. I mean, people just get in, fill the pod up because they, they want to get back to their car. I think it might be an issue if you were talking about, you know, two hours travel time, but we're talking about relatively short travel distances here. I would confer and there hasn't been any issues in terms of what you sometimes find is if people are sitting backwards there's no one else they'll move over to the other seat and face forward but it hasn't been an issue at all. Having said that of course the, uh, the, the Heathrow pod hasn't got very big windows so it depends what you want to look at. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the loveliest scenery either. <laughs> any more questions? I have one that's really more of a comment, but twice in the session it was mentioned that ride sharing is more than, voluntary ride sharing is more than was anticipated. And I think that's a quite significant thing. I think it relates to Arno's question about this tendency to make, P define PRT as very small vehicles. Uh, Versus what I observe in the PRT and APMs in general, there seems to be a predominant direction to make vehicles larger. And I think that's what we're seeing uh, here. And if, if indeed experience continues to be that people are not as hesitant about sharing a, r a ride with someone they don't know, uh, then that will relieve some of the, the reason for trying to make them as small as possible. I, I do think we have to be careful there because we're dealing with systems that have limited number of stations. Mm -hmm. So actually, the chance that this person behind you is going to the same place is very high. Mm -hmm. As the systems grow, the chance that the person behind you is going to a different place, mm -hmm. I think that you'll start to see some different behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, thank you to the speakers and to the audience. Uh, and uh, we go, we have a two hour break to uh, absorb the exhibits and then uh, for those going to the dinner tonight. So. Thank you.